Thank you, Joanna, for those kind words of introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Moore, and I have the great privilege of being Director of Future Screens NI. What an uplifting event Beyond has been so far, and you're very welcome to day four. It's been hugely uplifting in these bizarre and kind of strange times, but as anyone who knows me will tell you, I'll soon put a stop to all that nonsense. I'll soon stop it being uplifting. Um, first of all, before I do anything, I want to thank the Beyond team um, for the opportunity to show what Future Screens NI has been trying to do over this period. And it's very important right at the start that I say that I have the privilege of standing or sitting, as it is, um, at the stage this morning and telling this story. But this is not a story about me. This is a story about everyone who is a partner, and it's a story about the management team. And you will forgive me if I want to make sure that they're all named right at the start. So my colleagues, um, Frank Lyons, Michael Alcorn, Daphne Masai, um, Rory Clifford, um, our project manager, Nola Toman, and Matt Wiley, without whom none of this would have been possible um, at any point. And I sincerely mean that. I want to make sure that um, they get the full recognition that they ought to have. What we want to try and do today is to look at what our strategy has been um, since March, since the onslaught of the pandemic. And we think that we have made a very conscious decision to try and shift slightly the focus of what we were doing in order to address one aspect of the creative clusters aims or objectives that I think every one of the clusters was dealing with in, um, in a way which was, if you like, informal, although we did some formal projects. Um, and that is the aspect of social and cultural dividend. How do we show the social and cultural dividend that we are bringing to the space? And how do we show the connections we have with the community? Because the last thing we need in this space is a free floating crew of industries, which doesn't ever impact on the rest of the, of the community and on the rest of society. And that's particularly important to us, as you might imagine, in Northern Ireland, that we do that because we believe sincerely that the creative industries can become the new heavy industries, but only if they are embedded in the way in which people operate. So what I'm going to try and do at the outset is to do an overview with some slides of exactly how that strategy developed. Some of it was by default, some of it was by design. And I do want to try and give an indication of the theoretical thinking that went in around that. And then we will come to the important part of the day. I promise you I'll not be boring for too long. And then we'll come to the important part of the morning, which is looking at some of the projects which have come out of this and the work which have come out of this and the way in which we have had to develop different types of collaboration in order to facilitate the ways in which these projects can operate. So Future Screens NI, if we go to um, the slide deck, Future Screens NI is um, one of the nine creative clusters. Um, we had in total 13 million uh, to invest over um, the five years. And we set out, as they all did, with very clear economic um, objectives. The issue for us, though, was that those economic objectives can only be delivered fully if they're delivered in the context of embedding it within the society and making sure that all aspects of society um, had an equal and a diverse and an inclusive um, access to what was going on in that. And that's been a, a crucial piece for us as we've been trying to work through it. But we need to think, when the pandemic came, we needed to think very quickly about how we were going to address this and how we were going to continue with that work. And we made a very conscious decision that we wanted to move very quickly into trying to do projects which supported as wide a section of the community that we work with as possible. Now, that is something that, that I, I would imagine all the clusters would want to do. Um, but in a way, in Northern Ireland, um, it became an imperative because it is such a small place and we do all operate together. And so we felt we needed to move into that space very quickly um, in order that we could raise our visibility and indicate that we wanted to support people. Clearly, we wanted to give people um, awards that would allow them to come through the crisis. But at the same time, we wanted to do something which was also future looking and which had allowed us to work with a wider section of the community than we had possibly done before. So what kind of thinking was actually driving this? Well, I want to mention a couple of texts and, and sets of ideas, if I may, to show what way we were thinking around this. Because 
And I'm not quite sure how this slide got there. It's a holding slide, and I, I meant to put something else in. So that's the first, um, the first mess up of the day, um, because this holding slide. But it actually works for me, because when the pandemic hit, we actually thought we were going into, not into a future, but into a future deferred. And we would simply say, no, we're not. We're not going to defer the future in any way. We're going to think about what opportunities this gives us. And I use a phrase around that, which I don't use in any trite way. And I, and I apologize to anybody um, who has had grief around the COVID piece. But the last thing we wanted to do in this situation was to waste a good pandemic. If you have this going on, we have to see it as an opportunity. And we have to see the ways in which we can use the changed circumstances in order to take us forward in a different way. So the first sets of thinking that we were um, thinking around came from a text by uh, Shreko Harvat called Poetry from the Future. And this is an interesting text insofar as Harvak's thesis, and he's a philosopher born in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and his thesis is that the impact, one of the impacts of free market economies on particularly small communities is to leave them with sometimes huge depression, but at best a melancholy about the future. And the strategy he offers out of that melancholy is a strategy of hope. Not a naive hope, because he, along with Terry Eagleton, um, has no time for optimism, which he says is a luxury that only the middle classes can afford. But hope built as a strategy and as a way of ensuring that communities can come together to address the future. And he uses popular cultural texts, things like The Handmaid's Tale, as metaphors, although on some occasions he uses some of these texts, like Mamma Mia, as an actual literal example of what happened when Mamma Mia went to the island where the film was made and how that devastated that community economy, the impact of that and the impact of people then coming to that island. And he uses these as a way of, of showing how that strategy of hope can be built and how a real creative community activism can be put together. And he, he cites um, his great colleague, um, Zizek, when he says, what we need to have is the courage of hopelessness. And I thought that was a huge phrase for us to take forward into that pandemic piece. What was going to be our courage of hopelessness? How were we going to ensure that we could offer some kind of support which said, okay, this is terrible. It might not go away, but let's see what we can do when we're within it. Obviously we now have the vaccine. We're in a slightly different place. And obviously we have to celebrate that. The second set of thinking um, came from Jeff Mulgan in a document which, as you see, he released in April 2020. He was obviously working at this for some time and it wasn't pandemic driven, but it came at a beautiful time. It was a piece of work done for um, Demos Helsinki. And the imaginary crisis he speaks about, he doesn't mean that the crisis is imaginary. What he means is that there is a crisis of imagination and a crisis of public imagination. And we have allowed ourselves to fall into structurations and forms of infrastructures which have stopped us from applying the most vivid aspects of our imaginations to the work that we do. And the interesting thing for us in that was that he makes a hugely interdisciplinary argument. We're not entirely convinced about inter interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity. We like to think of ourselves as anti-disciplinarity. But what Jeff Mulgan argues is that we need to, in all our disciplines, from social sciences to sciences to the artists, start applying and finding ways in which we can grow that imagination again, because that is what will give us a way out of this pandemic. If we can find new ways to deal with the problems we have and the issues we have, that takes us into an extraordinarily opportunist and an extraordinarily hopeful space if we know that this is something that we can apply our own imaginations to and take it forward. That also was complemented by a number of texts. I'm only using this one from Douglas Rushkoff called Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. Um, but a number of, of texts which asked, what is the nature of growth? Now within all economic ventures, growth appears to be um, the great target that we should all be aiming for. We should be aiming for growth and we should be able to show that growth with data. But on some occasions, growth needs to be thought about carefully. Because in the Northern Irish context, for example, 
development is at some points more important than growth. There are companies that can be pushed into huge growth, but the vast part of the sector might actually need development rather than growth. So we need to step back and think, okay, what is the strategy we need within this space? Not to necessarily think about maximum growth, but to think about maximum development of the sector as it's coming forward. And so that was hugely important to us. And finally, if I can move to the, the final theoretical piece that we were thinking about, I want to, in a very obtuse way, talk about John Wycliffe. Now, I've no doubt that there are people um, viewing this at the moment and listening at the moment who know a great deal more about John Wycliffe than I do. But Wycliffe for me has developed what I like to call the Wycliffe factor. Because John Wycliffe was a philosopher, but I would say a futurist in the 14th century. And he had an amazing vision of the future, which included challenging the then dominant church. And in the nature of challenging that, he actually did a translation of the Bible into English. His problem was that he had no way of getting that Bible out to people because the technology did not exist. So the Wycliffe factor for me brings forward a number of things. The first is that the technology is always about cultural form. Technology in itself is not something we're desperately interested in. But he had made a moonshot. He had made a technological moonshot for his period in writing this New English Bible. His problem was at the other end, he did not have the technology to get it to the people. And so it wasn't until Martin Luther came and that Bible goes out and the printing press is there that that gets to the maximum number of people. And so for me, what the Wycliffe factor says is, okay, yes, we do the moonshots, but we also need to think about what are the technologies who can get to the highest number of people possible within a social setting in order to allow them to think about having access to the moonshot at some point. In other words, we need to be thinking at both ends of the te technological paradigm because you only shift the paradigm if you're getting to the maximum number of people. And I, th I suppose if I can use a bridge analogy, what we hope that Future Screens and I would become was the bridge between both those ends, working the moonshot, but also opening up to a much wider part of the community than we've previously been working with. Because the key thing about a bridge is it has the wisdom of knowing both shores. And so if we knew both those shores, we could develop strategies in a much more profound way. The matrix that we work in is like many. And we would like to think that we were working in industry, very much so. We were working in education, sometimes specifically, sometimes by default. We were developing policy. Ulster is fortunate in being part of the PEC consortium as well, the Policy and Evidence Centre. But the piece that we couldn't say we were concretely working in was within the community. And this was our opportunity to do that. Of course, we had projects which were community-based, but it wasn't necessarily part of our active strategy um, on a constant basis. And so we took the opportunity to make it so during that period. So what we did then was um, we, we put out um, two funding calls, two key funding calls, one of which is still active. The first was rewriting the narrative, which went out in March. And we said we would give £5,000 to 20 um, people or organisations to do work which was community-based, but using the technologies which were available at the time. The take-up on that was phenomenal. We actually ended up doing 32 of these. And again, at the risk of turning into a love and I should give a call out to our AHRC colleagues, um, particularly Joanna Litton-Jones, who was very supportive during that period and made sure that we were able to expand in ways that allowed us to address the community fully during that period. That rewriting the narrative simply said to people, tell us how you're going to do things in this new circumstance. Tell us how you're going to continue to do your work within this new circumstance. And some of the projects which come out of that were phenomenal. A number of them we talked about for quite a long time, and you're going to see one of them today, because some of them appear to be out of scope. But there were sectors, for example, the craft sector, which were, to all intents and purposes, invisible to many of us, and probably were one of the sectors that were, in some ways, going to be most affected by this, because they need to get their wares to the public in public spaces. 
I think we would all agree that most of our industries, because they work mainly online, were able to continue and actually many grew during this period. But something like craft has a different set of problems. And so what we, we, we saw in a particular project, which you're going to see from Louise Taylor, was a way in which we could move into that space and support a project with a view to allowing that to become a moonshot. Louise works in tapestry. And she's doing some incredible work around tapestry with communities, which she'll talk about herself. But where we want to get Louise to, and we've talked about this, um, and I'm hopefully not um, putting this in the public uh, in a way to terrify her in any way, but we, we're hoping that eventually Louise will work with us to develop the pandemic tapestry based on all the key data which is coming out about COVID over the period. And thinking about applying perhaps some machine learning to see what kind of patterns would come out of that data in order that it could be made into a tapestry. So in other words, what we're trying to do is to bring the analog into an interface with the digital, to bring the moonshot in with the work which is being done with the community at this time. So some things looked as though they were out of scope, but actually we felt that this was a way of creating development for all the community rather than people that we were normally working with. We then, in November, launched a call called Narrative Futures, which was very much aimed at 2030. Okay, we've seen what's happening now. We've seen what's going on. We know where we're going to go. The vaccine's here. How are we going to behave in 2030? And what way will we be using those technologies? Now that, in a way, is um, a little bit provocative. And if the person who needs to be blamed for this, it's Alex McDowell's fault from the World Building Institute, who we've been working with on a, on a project for young disenfranchised people within the Northern Ireland region. But Alex constantly pushed us to thinking about that future space. And so that doesn't actually close, that narrative futures doesn't close until Friday. So I can't tell you anything about it. But we know that we're going to have the same kind of thinking and the same kind of imagination applied here as we saw in rewriting the narrative. And we're trying to bookend it and create two ends of the bridge of which we know both shores. What that then did, however, and this is where it gets interesting is, it gave us a visibility with people perhaps that we didn't have that visibility before. And so our response strategy turned into something much larger. So we have rewriting the narrative we've spoke about, um, we've spoken about, um, and that in full turned out about 385K. And I'm only giving the numbers here to give you an idea of, of how this thing exploded in a way. We were asked to give some freelance support um, through our great partners, Northern Ireland Screen, um, and we did that. And then the big piece for us was that the Department of Communities asked us if we would like to get involved with a major, major bid, which was being funded from government, but which was being handled by Arts Council Northern Ireland. And that if we wanted to contribute to that, we could move into that resilience call. Now that is a profound move in a number of ways. Firstly, it allows us to make connections with the artistic community. And I'm not going to make any bones about that. Many of the artistic community are slightly nervous about the notion of creative industries. And we've had to work very hard um, to make the argument that if you're an artist, you're still allowed to put food on the table and it doesn't have to be in the quality of misery. Um, and, and for us to be allowed to work with the Arts Council and for the Arts Council to come to us and be involved in that was a huge breakthrough. Um, and out of that, we've actually created what we call the Future Foundation which will do talent capacity building to help artists think about where they can get funding and the, the types of funding they can get and move forward. And we're able to develop mentors who can work with artists in that way. We had the opportunity through Northern Ireland Screen to appoint some Putnam scholars, which again gave us huge visibility in the space, um, lots of newspaper coverage and so on. Um, and then we had the follow-up call, um, as I say, to rewriting the narrative. What all of this did was it, bring, it brought us into the public domain, but it was the actual projects which brought us into the public domain as well. Because what we had done, and it was a phrase used by some of my AHRC colleagues, sadly I can't remember which one, but credit to them anyway. What we had done, quite unbeknownst to ourselves, was we had discovered discoverable. The stuff that was out there that we should have been seeing, but weren't necessarily seeing because the calls weren't focused in the right way. And what then happened was we came to the attention of government and we began to work very closely with the Department of Communities and we began to work very closely with um, the Department of Economy, both of those. And Future Screens NI has been invited into some of the advisory groups 
which are actually operating in that space. And we're able to make the argument that in Northern Ireland, the creative industries has to be at that advisory table. And we're able to make it to the right people. Because the example I always give is that fisheries, quite rightly, are at that table making negotiations. Fisheries bring in 220 million pounds a year to the economy. At this point, the creative industries bring in 1.2 billion. Therefore, at least we ought to be at the table um, being involved in that narrative at that level. And so that is what has happened. And the proof of that, if you like, is that we now have ministers actively involving themselves in what we're doing. And you have here um, the Minister for Communities. Uh, she's taking a break at the moment and we have a, a, another minister at the time who is equally being equally as important. But at the time when we were launching, um, Minister Hargan was constantly um, tweeting about us and was constantly giving us um, indication that they were working fully with us. And so our visibility opened much more to the community. That was also helped by the projects because again, without embarrassing Louise that you're going to um, speak with in a moment, um, they were getting publicity as well. So Louise found herself um, on things like Children in Need and she'll probably tell you the story herself. Zoe Seaton from Big Telly that you're going to hear from um, found herself all over the globe talking about what they were trying to do in terms of theatre. Um, you had uh, people making uh, work with separate ethnic communities in Belfast that you're going to hear about, which gave us greater visibility. And what have happened, of course, was that we had now moved into a much more complex space where community was coming, becoming the key area that we worked in. And what we had come, become, um, to use a phrase that has been used recently by Andrew Chitty, was that we had become a cultural broker in that space. And we had been using whatever sort of entrepreneurship skills we had learned over the two years up until now in order to develop that cultural brokerage and to take us forward. And what we discovered was that there were actually, we were operating with four types of collaboration. So the first was developmental collaboration, where we'd be working with people or companies who were in the very early stages and perhaps didn't fully see the extent to which they could develop. And that collaboration allowed us to take those forward. We were working in facilitatory collaboration, where what we were merely doing was taking people who knew what they were doing and knew what they wanted to do and facilitated them in order to do that and to take that forward. We were working in strategic collaboration with government, with government agencies, with Northern Ireland Screen, with Invest NI, with all the other partners that we needed to work with in a much more strategic way to ensure the creative industries were somehow at the table making the argument. And how beautiful it is that what brought us to those tables was actively working on the social and cultural dividend, that the economic and the culture have seen to be, are now seen to be in the Northern Ireland context, one thing and not two separate things. And of course, we had to work with pragmatic collaboration. I have to say that because sometimes those collaborations aren't easy. And you may get press releases going out about a project that you're heavily involved in, but they don't mention you. But what you've got to do there is be pragmatic and step back and not get precious about it and allow the collaboration to develop without creating any fuss about unnecessary things. So that's an overview, if you like, of the context for the things that you're going to see and hear now. Um, and these projects, we could have picked any of the 32, um, but these we think identify and resonate with the kinds of points I've been trying to make in setting up that contextual piece. And the first one I want to hand you over to um, is Louise Taylor, um, who will tell you a little bit about her involvement with us and the way in which she has been able to develop her company over the last few months. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and thanks so much for having uh, me over here. It's a real huge step for me and my business. So I hope, um, I hope I explain a bit about me and you can fully, and I'll accept any questions at the end. Um, so I am Louise Taylor. I own Little Forget-Me-Nots and Little Forget-Me-Nots is a handmade punch needle and embroidery brand based here right in Northern Ireland. I found embroidery over three years ago after a personal loss that left me feeling the need to offload my thoughts and feelings um, counselling just wasn't cutting it for me. Uh, I'm not saying counselling doesn't work, it just wasn't my way of expressing myself and I really needed something else to 
channel my thoughts every day. So since I was 18, I've worked with traditional crafters, helping them develop, develop, deliver workshops in the community. I coordinate heritage lottery projects too. I'm always dreaming up ways of bringing new life to traditional skills that are forgotten right here in Northern Ireland. In today's world, it's incredibly difficult to be a traditional crafter. Everyone is told to stay at home, but we are so eager to see what the next person is doing. It's impossible. I grew up witnessing how craft can bring such calmness to life. I was, never, I was never able to see it until I felt true loss. Before, I always questioned what it took to become a traditional crafter. I always thought it would be a fun job, but I guess there lies the secret. The craft is a part of you. It's who you are, it's your thoughts and your feelings, and that's why it is so beautiful. A traditional craft is truly unique. So, okay, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, that's just a wee bit of what I, I do truly believe that craft comes from within you, and I say it every single day. So enough of the sappiness, and I'll go over to my short film. It'll give you a wee bit of clarity of what Little Forget Me Nots actually is, and I'll show you a couple of uh, products that I have produced for the Christ Christmas period. So uh, the wee video will come on now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Louise Taylor and I am the designer, the owner, the creator over at Little Forget Me Nuts. Little Forget Me Nuts is a punch needle and embroidery brand. I have spent this year refocusing my business and reconnecting with you guys. I really do believe that if we are not going to be starting conversations in today's world, then depression is going to set in, isolation is going to set in, and I'm here to help you find super fun crafts and just have a bit of fun learning a new skill. At Little Forget Me Nuts we have designed kits for all skill sets from beginners to more advanced. We believe that using these kits to work through life's troubles is just one thing that really helps us over here and that's what we try and advocate every day and also we get to make something really really pretty at the end of it. These kits have been used for hen parties via Zoom, which has been really, really good. Recently, we had a customer tell us that she had bought two rainbow hand embroidery kits that she used to talk through a family bereavement, which I find really, really amazing that she used craft to chat over life difficulties. Over here, we have a kit for everyone. Our hand embroidery kits are for beginners and they give you the confidence to take on your own projects. Our punch nail kits are really popular too and they sell out so quickly. You're probably wondering what is punch nail? This is one of the kits that I sell. It is the wee bunny kit and it is super cute. These kits come pre-stamped so you don't have to worry about sketching the design on the canvas. They also come pre-stretched on the frame so it's literally punch and go. You and then also the needle is really really easy to thread too so you don't have to fuss about the threaders. So you are set up, ready to go, the design is on the frame. All you need to do is just grab a comfy seat, a nice cup of tea and get punching. These kits are designed to help you get creative. They're allowing you to find that creativity that lies inside you. Like I know myself that embroidery, hand embroidery, all traditional skills have been lost and we have just been so used to going buying pre-made stuff that we don't allow ourselves to get creative. When I first started doing this, my mum actually told me that my great granny used to buy rug making kits and hand embroidery kits and then she came down the stairs one day with a fire guard that was embroidered and I'm sure everybody in the country's granny had, had the exact same one but that's how many generations this is actually missing. So that was my great granny and now I'm trying to reinvent your creativity to help you produce something really pretty again. I hope that was helpful and once again I'm Louise from Little Forget Me Nuts and you can find us at littleforgetmenuts.com and come over and follow us on Instagram.
So I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, I think it was, I'm very visual and I like seeing what people are really talking about. So at the beginning of lockdown, I started to get an, an influx of messages asking how I did this, how I did that. I have always been transparent on social media of how I started embroidery, why I started embroidery. And recently I found punch needle and I completely just absorbed my mind in punch needle to try and get over my my own personal grief. And then also with this whole pandemic, and um, it really it really helped me so people started to ask me for help and um, they wanted to keep their minds active they wanted to figure out how i i, I coped and um, then it came to people asking me to supply them with kits and then the orders started going and me trying to balance my creativity my orders it was all just starting to get a very muddled. Um, and I also wanted to start designing kits for people too, and um, just to give them a head start with embroidery and their punch nail. It all wasn't as lovely as how I imagined. I thought when I seen other people on social media, everything was lovely, but it was so crazy. But but I loved it. I was thriving. It was really, really good. And um, I was getting the, the message out there that embroidery and punch needle helped me through a rough time but the business side of things was lacking and that was really really pulling me back so I needed to smarten up my online classes how you book on to them my presence presence online was lacking and I was really trying to help people but was going about it unprofessionally so the opportunity came up with future screens to help people help like people like me to become more visible online and um, I wanted to demonstrate how keeping our hands busy through trauma for example grief or depression can help us process thoughts not everyone fits into the counseling category I know I don't it just didn't work for me so I needed to help find a way to translate that online Writing all of this down in paper was a huge step for me and it was a turning point in my business. Then when I received the word that I was successful, I couldn't believe that someone else could see the vision of my business. This gave me so much confidence and I completely grasped it, grasped it and just ran with it. So I told everybody that I can do this now. It was like, it was like somebody was giving me the ticket to own what I was doing. It was, it was incredible. So fast forward a few crazy, crazy, crazy months. Um, I've been selling out of my kits each month. People are beginning to see the true benefits of making something with their hands. I'm also connecting people through the good and the bad times. People are using these kits to begin conversations. They're igniting their creativity and that's helping a lot of people. So currently I'm delivering an online workshop of with um, 30 senior citizens via Zoom. They are all shielding from this virus. The conversation sometimes gets a little dark, but we are all there to help one another up and we're concentrating on something too. So, you know, we're picking the conversation up when, when we're working, which is so visible to me as, as a facilitator. So I've done all of the research when it comes to punch nail and embroidery and designed a hassle-free kit that the user has just to focus on the hidden benefits of a traditional skill. So I hope you've enjoyed listening over here and I really do look forward to your questions um, if you have any. <laughs> so I'm going to pop you over to Paul again and um, enjoy the rest of the slides. Thank you, Louise. Um, beautiful, beautiful, uh, and exactly, um, exactly an example of what we were talking about and way in which you apply your own creativity to the space. I have to tell people we didn't talk beforehand, so I didn't tell you to put that hope tapestry up behind you. No, that's per my, that's my, um, I, I have hope, I live my life by hope. How perfect is that? I just want to say in terms of the questions that um, if you keep putting your questions in the chat box, we'll, we'll try and take as many of those once we've heard all the presentations from my colleagues. Um, and hopefully there will be lots of questions. So thank you, Louise, for that. I'm going to move on to now to our um, second set of presenters. Um, and again, what we wanted to do when we were trying to develop this strategy was to reach out to members of the community that perhaps we didn't um, deal with or come into contact with as often as we should. 
And this is where uh, I'm delighted to say um, Jordan Whitehead and Celine Guizard came into the picture. So I think I'm handing over first to Jordan. Yes, thank you so much, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us today. Um, my name is Jordan Whitefield. I am the producer on the animation The Virus and Me. Um, the Virus and Me is an animation inspired by anonymous research with the Chinese community in Northern Ireland during the COVID-19 pandemic. 34 participants shared their experience of living here in Northern Ireland and how the pandemic has affected their livelihoods and families. So I'm going to speak a little bit about why we chose this area, how we conducted the research, and then my director, Selene, will share more about our creative process and how we produced the final product. So why did we choose this area to focus on? There were various reports of discrimination towards the Chinese community in Northern Ireland due to the origin of their coronavirus. People were closing down their restaurants before even any governmental restrictions were imposed, just to avoid any attacks. People were verbally abused in the streets and some people's homes were also targeted. Um, I can't tolerate any form of discrimination or intolerance. And as Northern Ireland is moving forward from its often troubled past, uh, uh, we wanted to create a film that was highlighting the issues that are still present here, but also ignite conversations in the hope of making a contribution to social change and um, to encourage people to be more inclusive to embrace their differences and to treat each other as they would like to be treated themselves. Selene and I had been uh, waiting to work together on the right project for a while. And when we saw the Future Screens NI rewriting the narrative call, we just jumped on the opportunity. And um, we both share a real passion for conversations around mental health and well-being, and felt there was an opportunity to work with the Chinese community and to offer a platform to share their experience of this unique time to start a conversation about their sense of belonging in Northern Ireland and to raise awareness of the discrimination they often can face. So how did we go about carrying out the research? Um, well, we worked really closely with the Chinese Welfare Association here in Northern Ireland, who were a wonderful partner in helping us conduct the research we needed. Um, it was really important that the research was conducted anonymously to give people a safe space to truly express their feelings and their experiences without any fear of scrutiny. So the um, Chinese Welfare Association helped us recruit participants through their networks. They helped us translate the survey and the final script, and they were a fantastic sounding board for the entire project. We were acutely aware that neither Selene or I were from the Chinese community. So it was crucial that the research project and the subsequent findings were fair and representative of the Chinese community here in Northern Ireland. We also worked closely with a mental health qualitative researcher from Queen's University Belfast who helped us ensure the research project um, was ethical and the survey was worded with sensitivity. We wanted to spark conversation and thought but we also didn't want to contribute to anyone's personal challenges during the pandemic by using any loaded terms or triggering emotions. So what did we find out? Um, well the majority of participants, nearly uh, 65%, had lived in Northern Ireland for more than 10 years. And um, around 74% said that Northern Ireland felt like home for them. Around about the same amount enjoyed living in Northern Ireland, which was lovely to hear. Um, most people felt part of the community, but around about 40% had experienced negativity towards them as a member of the Northern Irish community. Um, and around the same said that the pandemic had affected their mental health nearly 60% had been financially impacted by the pandemic and around about 24% felt treated differently as a result of the pandemic. So really, really interesting findings. Um, you know, although some of the 34 participants had negative experiences, a lot of positivity was felt about living here. As there are up to 8,000 people in the Chinese community here in Northern Ireland, we're aware that more research needs to be carried out due to the small survey sample. However, it was heartening to see that the majority of people felt a sense of belonging here. But even then, that was only at 67.6%. So there's still work to be done. The pandemic has affected everyone in different ways. So it would be interesting to compare our findings with a wider study to see whether our findings reflect wider society or whether being part of the Chinese community here in Northern Ireland has had more of an impact on our participants' lifestyle and well-being during the pandemic. So what's next for our research? 
Um, well, our hope is that the animation will raise awareness of the Chinese community's experience of Northern Irish society and encourage conversations around inclusivity, belonging and community. The Chinese Welfare Association is proposing to use the animation as a catalyst for workshops and conversations with their community groups, which is exactly how we'd like the final piece to be used. So now Selene is going to speak about how we use the research to inform the creative project um, and produce something that reflected the Chinese community's experience. Thank you, Jordan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Selene. Uh, I'm the writer and director of The Virus in Me. Um, and so as Jordan just said, I'm going to talk a bit about the creative process. Um, what was really interesting about this animation is that um, we have applied for funding and we kind of had a mood board and a few ideas, but when, you know, we didn't have, a, I would say, a very detailed idea of what, what was going to be on screen exactly, because, you know, when you do research or survey, you can't, you know, you, you can't guess people's answers, you can't, you don't know when, you don't know how people feel, uh, it's just always harder to, you know, come up with a detailed idea. So, um, so yeah, we had to be quite flexible, but actually, I actually think it was one of the strengths of the project. You know, we were able to adapt ourselves to, you know, whatever was in the survey uh, that we still wrote, you know, but still, you don't know what type of answers you're going to get. Um, so once the, we had the answers, um, which were, we were quite thrilled actually, actually to have that many answers. Uh, we all sat down uh, through Zoom, obviously, um, and we talked about them. So me, Jordan and Trisha. Um, and then I kind of think, so we talked through them and then I think it only took me a weekend to write the script uh, because it was only three pages. So three minutes animation. So it's it's short. But um, I think one of the reasons why is because um, the answers were just so um, self-explanatory. You know, they were, some of them were so strong. You know, they were they were just telling me the story. You know, I kind of feel like I didn't have much to do because some of the some of the answers were just very um, strong and yeah, they were saying a lot. Um, so what I did um, to be a bit more practical is I just printed out everything and I just sat there with my highlighter and just highlighted all the answers I liked first, not looking at who the individuals, and then I kind of looked at individuals and see. Um, you know, uh, obviously everything was anonymous, but what I mean is, you know, lines of answers to see who said what and what series of answers um, we had just to get to get some type of profile. And again, that really inspired me to get some characters. I think, I think at the start of the project as well, we kind of thought we would go towards something more experimental, but actually, you know, again, reading the answers, you know, I just felt there were so many the characters, they are kind of like taking up space in my head. So I kind of felt like, okay, we're going to have to tell a story and we're going to have to use a main character and share what she experiences. Um, so that's basically how I created the, um, the characters. You know, the mother to me represents the overall positive, positivity um, that was in the survey. Then the father represents, uh, you know, the fear of hiding discrimination due to the pandemic. And then the daughter represents the, the fear of the of the virus and every, the virus being everywhere. You'll see in the animation. Uh, but yeah, that's that way of working just created characters for me. And so that's how, how I wrote the script. Um, and what I can say as well is that um, so this flexibility I was talking at the start, it wasn't only for the script. I think it really helped us um, throughout the entire project. We were all freelancers, so we know what flexibility is. Um, and, um, you know, we just, so I was very happy for, to hand the script over. I had a few visuals written in the script, but I just basically said, you know, I just told the um, illustrator to work ahead, you know, this is the script, just show me how you see it. And obviously she came up with many, many brilliant ideas. And the animator as well came along and shared a few ideas. So. And again, we were just going back and forth all the time. And that's what I was saying about flexibility. You know, we just, we made sure that everybody had their inputs. And I'm very happy to say that this was a very collaborative project. Um, because sometimes when you work through Zooms, you're a bit scared of like how things are gonna get, you know. Um, I had never worked with the illustrator nor the animator before. So, uh, but it worked out really well. And we were just all really opened. And I think it's because as Jordan was saying, we just really wanted to, 
represent the best that we could. You know, the, um, we, wanted, we wanted the animation to be to feel honest and truthful. That was really important for us. Um, and I'm just going to finish off by saying by May, the voice of your artist isn't here, but um, I'm just going to do a wee shout out for her because, you know, she was very professional, very approachable, um, and her voice just fits so well the animation. Uh, I think she brought a lot to the project and um, yeah, I think she did a brilliant job. So I just wanted to finish up with that. Um, yeah, and I think I'm just not going to say any more. I think I've said a lot already. I don't want to, you know, spoil it too much for you. So um, yeah, just let's just watch the video then. Thank you very much. I wish I could see them up close. For me, life is calm, but this pandemic is a challenge I never expected to face. I try to keep my head up and to stay busy. my family to open up and to share what we worry about. My daughter says she feels a bacteria bouncing around everywhere. We're scared to get the virus and to contaminate others. There's a sense of panic as if the end of the world is coming. We also struggle financially. I'm not sure when I'll go back to work. We try to save money as much as we can. Home cooking is a great way to do so and to keep our little one entertained, for a while at least. Homeschooling has been more challenging than I expected. There are a lot of distractions in the house. Supervising her work has affected our relationship, which is really upsetting for me. My husband worries too. He thinks people will discriminate against us even more because of where they think the virus came from. I have to admit that some negativity has been felt towards the Chinese community here. I haven't experienced it personally, but I'm aware of it. My neighbors had eggs thrown out their windows. Some friends have been robbed, and some have been hurt by a group of teenagers. And when I wear a mask, people stare at me. But this is getting better. So, there are a lot of worries, but our community helps a lot. The Chinese community is united as one. We distributed masks and gloves, raised money for our friends and family in China, donated to the NHS, and painted rainbows. I received a mask from my daughter's school, and I felt the warmth of the staff's hearts. We got to know our neighbours better, and we played some online games and quizzes with friends. I've learned a lot during these scary few months. I accepted the challenge to maintain a good attitude, and I'm doing my best. Despite the reports of negativity from our community, Northern Ireland feels like home. Living here for more than a decade, I'm used to the lifestyle and customs. I want my child to grow up here and to be integrated into the Northern Irish family. I feel hopeful about the future. Although the pandemic is serious, I believe that one day life will return to normal. And when it does, we'll be the first to run out and get some fresh air. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and there will be a Q and A at the end. So if you have any questions, you know, just feel free to ask in the in the in this chat, and we'll be happy to answer them. So back to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, so and I think we can see um, that's a perfect example to my mind of the Whitecliff factor, where you use the the most available technologies to get the message to the highest number of people. Um, and I would thank you for the work that you've done on that very important work. And we, we have a, a weekly session called Future Tuesdays. And when Solène and Jordan were presenting at that, um, they were very high ranking members of the Chinese community there. And it's important to see that because again, it means we can develop much wider collaborations as future screens in very important spaces. So I want to come to um, our final 
case study this morning. Um, Zoe Seaton is going to tell us about work with Big Telly. Big Telly were a well-established, well-recognized company prior to the pandemic. But what was so special about Zoe's work is that, and the work of Big Telly is that they didn't just want to do um, digital television of theater. They wanted to find a way that these new possibilities and these, these new technologies could offer new ways of presenting the canon around theater and indeed extravagantly imaginative pieces of work that they brought together themselves. So Zoe, tell us all about it. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, well, Big Telly has been going for 30 years. You're right, it's established. Uh, the name came from a little girl who talked about theatre as the Big Telly, and I love the accessibility of that. Um, and since then, we've reinvented ourselves many times. Uh, and in, in some ways, it's only now that our name makes sense. Uh, what we're always trying to do is to ask the question, how live can we get? How deep can our human connection be? Are we making our audience feel present? We constantly seek new ways and places to tell stories and make live theatre, having toured to most theatres on this island, the Edinburgh Festival, West End London and internationally. Fueled by a desire to make the ordinary, extraordinary and create theatre in unexpected places, we've also made shows and experiences in shops, cattle markets, bus stations and swimming pools. And we've got our very own theatre venue of converted horse box with a tiny stage, a lighting and sound system and footlights, which seats two in the balcony and two in the stalls. Quite often we start projects without knowing how they'll end up. In 2007, not just supported, but actively encouraged by the Arts Council, we created our first water theatre production programmed to play exclusively in three swimming pools outside Belfast. This was deliberately regional, relentlessly site specific, and I was fierce about the importance of intimacy in small audiences. It was widely ambitious and ridiculously big scale with a total team of 20, including a crew of professional divers and lifeguarding ASMs. Well, we had 13 international promoters at our first show and went on to perform it 110 times with a total audience of 30,000 on a world tour, including Taiwan, Denmark and Serbia, where we performed in an Olympic pool with a capacity of two and a half thousand. And what that taught us about ourselves was that we're not afraid of risk and that we're a lot more comfortable outside the box than in it. Since then, we've continued to make multi-platform site-specific immersive work, drawing on an eclectic range of techniques and influences such as gaming, escape rooms, computer hacking and burner phones. We've made a show about a TV that talks back and invites you to step inside the screen. We've made games which hijack existing infrastructure tech like intercom, security cameras, TV screens. We've put speakers in hoovers, walkie-talkies in prams, hidden cameras and clipboards and webcams on dogs and chickens. Who knew how hard it would be to attach a webcam to a chicken, especially as part of a touring show. Talking of chickens, one of the projects we're proudest of, which opened our eyes to the potential of tech to create a community, is a nine year programme called Spring Chickens for Older People, which involved no reminiscence, but invited participants to make radical acts of theatre. Our first set of shows happened simultaneously with 380 older people performing in five theatres across Northern Ireland, web streamed live so that less mobile residents could watch. What we didn't predict was that it would be watched live by nearly 4,000 people across the world and we'd get emails like one from a lady in South Africa saying, my children have never met their granny. For them to encounter her for the first time before performing stand-up comedy on stage in Armagh is the best introduction to her spirit we could have hoped for. For us, it is all about connection. When lockdown, lockdown, we were running six projects, one of which was a tour of the worst cafe in the world, a dystopian comedy where the menu was full of experiences which were banned like travel. And then the cloud burst and the audience were given masks to protect them from the fallout. Who knew? So we cancelled everything, which meant we had 20 freelance artists at home in isolation on the payroll. And we began experimenting with WhatsApp calls on phones. And I'm on a call with you and I dangle the phone out of the window. Does it make you feel like you're going to fall? putting four phones in a box so they can see each other and have a chat while I change from the security guard to the present. And then I called Lucy at Creation and suggested we imagine The Tempest. We reimagine The Tempest, which we had made last summer as a game for Zoom. I'd like to now ask the tech team to play a video of what happened next.
we have learned so much. In The Tempest, we learned that it is better to get actors to make a storm live than it is to resort to film. And we learned that audiences like to play, that participation is very different when you're in the comfort of your own home with the option to turn your camera off at any time, that people are liberated by the agency. When Ariel asked people to make bird signs, if you switched to gallery view, you'd see many, many people perched on the back of their sofas ready to fly. In Operation Elsewhere, we learned how to step further into the world of the audience. So people turned cushion covers into wedding outfits, put blankets over their heads so we could all hide together, made phone calls to the villain while we rescued the stolen bride. And when asked if they had war paint handy, people ran to the kitchen and covered themselves in mustard and ketchup. In the machine stops, they joined in with a revolution against underground living and took their laptops outside. And then because of the support of future screens, we had the chance to take it all much further. Creation Theatre came to us with the idea to present Alice in Wonderland as a virtual theme park, which just seemed the perfect way to present a non-linear narrative. I was already in discussion with Charisma AI and Fox Dog Studios about potential projects, and this seemed like the perfect one to collaborate on. We were also delighted to be able to secure funding from Innovate UK, which gave us the opportunity to take more risks and be more brave. We were all interested in that space in between theatre and gaming and AI. All of these industries work in different ways. We were asking Charisma AI to change things at speed without the chance to test drive user experiences across different devices and platforms. It was an amazing collaboration with a lot of learning on all sides. The whole experience was structured more like a game with an AI Cheshire cat, chat cat, a website containing choices of different scenes and a croquet game where you used a second device to draw your own hedgehog and get chased by the Queen of Hearts who then turned up virtually at the winner's house with jam tarts. At the start, Charisma AI managed to chop up all the individual Zoom windows so everyone fell down the rabbit hole. And at the end, we all escaped together, only we'd somehow turned it into playing cards. We realised early on that audiences were booking in groups. People with families dotted across the world were booking into the same show so they could be together. A whole street in Bristol came on the same night so they could see each other. The playfulness and the co-creation was not just about being part of our show. It was about connecting with each other and sharing an experience. Pre-COVID, we planned to make Macbeth in a derelict warehouse as part of the Belfast Festival called The Witch's House. I really wanted the audience to be part of the world made, for, made, made by the witches. When it became clear this wasn't going to happen, we started working on a version for Zoom, the perfect Halloween experience where the audience would dim the lights and be part of the world of Macbeth. We had been approached by Martin Collette from Channel 4 News, who became our creative consultant and introduced us to software which enabled the audience to accept invitations to attend a coronation, a banquet and a theatre, which meant that they were visually mixed into the story worlds where they sat beside strangers and waved and toasted and applauded together. And at the end, we held up signs saying where we were and we were all over the world. But for that evening, we were together. Having successfully transferred the entertainment side of our business to digital, we then looked at the projects which were focused on community cohesion and social change. We've just piloted Dear World, a new format, which is like an online soap opera with a branching narrative where the audience repulls and with the help of a live compare, choose what's happened, what happens next. It has proved to be a powerful way to engage a wider audience about specific issues, as well as a fascinating piece of entertainment, which is why it will ultimately work as a way to engage a wider audience about specific issues. We've also just piloted our first real live world project since March called Right Up Your Street, where households connected via a WhatsApp group find themselves in an unfolding situation where they guard stories, defeat destroyers and dance their way to victory. It was pure joy and happened when the nights were getting dark and there was a palpable dread of winter. The next phase of Right Up Your Street will twin neighbourhoods and create new common ground and remote connections. It will also be an extended experience which connects households with each other and with local shops. Thanks to funding from Arts Council and Future Screens, we're making a live performance called Incognito Controlled by an App, a fragmented reality game where teams co-create a narrative. This project's been in the planning since before lockdown. We're delighted to work with Scaffold Digital on it and it feels like the start of a new genre of work. We've been on an incredible journey over the last few months. We've learned a lot about tech and we're excited about future possibilities. What we've also learned is that brilliant tech can be as dangerous as a swanky rehearsal room. It can make weak ideas look better than they really are. And it's more important than ever before to drill into what we're trying to achieve in terms of people and relationships. We remain committed to life theatre, whether that be digital or in the real world. Over the last eight months, we've made too many new friends, reached too many new audiences, included too many people who were previously excluded to consider dropping the digital strand of our work. 
We believe that the experience as a remote audience can and should be different and unique in its own way rather than a copy of a live event. If we get that right, it will challenge all of us working within the industry to ensure that the live experience is worth making, which means that we will all have to up our game and surely that can only be a good thing. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Zoe. You will see from that that when you have a conversation with Zoe over Zoom, you're being bombarded with about 10 projects at a time. Um, I'm trying to mediate them all. But I think what is important about um, what Zoe is doing there, that it emphasizes what I was trying to say earlier, that technology is always about cultural form. The technology doesn't stand in itself. And the way in which Zoe's company has very quickly assimilated and is using technologies which they would not perhaps have thought about had we not had the pandemic is really interesting. And Future Screens and I is really proud to have been involved in a collaboration with Big Telly. So thank you, Zoe, for that. We have a number of questions coming in. Keep them coming, if you wouldn't mind. Um, the first one's addressed, well, the first couple are addressed to Future Screens themselves. So we're being asked, um, how have we used creative approaches to reconciliation and dealing with difficult times that might leave Northern Ireland better place to deal with the fallout from the pandemic? And what lessons can the rest of the country take and how to apply creative approaches to recovering from the pandemic. Well, it is true, it was very interesting in the early stages of the first lockdown, I don't even know which number we're on now, but during the first lockdown, the number of people who said, oh, well, we're just back the way it used to be in the 70s, you, you can't go out anywhere and you have to stay at home. Um, so I suppose there was a reconciliation or a, a resilience piece, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't emphasize that because, or overemphasize it because, Many people in Northern Ireland are tired of that kind of label. There's a fabulous piece of uh, a mural on the Shankill Road in Belfast as you travel up, um, which simply says, stop calling us resilient. Um, so it's not necessarily something that's in, in, indigenous to the, to the area. But I think what we've learned in terms of the creative approaches is that the creative application of technologies to issues which are close to the people in the community, allows them to think about those things in a way that they might not have done otherwise, and allows them to address them in a safer environment than if they were being lifted out of their community and taken somewhere else. And one of the questions that later on that I'm being asked there is, what, what method or approach have you found to be most effective at bridging the gap between the technology and the community to engage most people? But I think what that is about is work with the people who are already working in the communities. Don't go in and try and impose yourself in that community. Go and see what they're doing, support that, and where possible, introduce the technologies into that space. But you must work with the people who are there because they understand the community and they understand what they're doing. And that's really important because we don't. With the best will in the world, we don't know what is going on in those communities. So you look who the, for the people who are already working there and then look for ways in which you can introduce the technologies into that is the best answer I have to that. Um, I want to go to um, Jordan, if I may, or Solène, whoever wants to come in. Um, there's a question asking, have you had the chance to measure or how are you going to measure the impact of the animation on people's attitudes? Mm, good question. Um, I think that the next step really is for us to work with the Chinese Welfare Association because they have a plan to use the animation um, very much in their uh, separate, um, they have, I think they have a mental health well-being group. They have also different age um, demographics as well. So I think um, the next step is to work with them on a kind of a, a measuring and analysis kind of um, reporting process. Um, but I think, Selene, have you got any thoughts on that? That's a really good question and probably something we should think a bit more about. Um, yeah, I think uh, we might uh, apply to, uh, you know, send it to a few festivals and I mean, obviously we would love to screen it, uh, but obviously it's not possible. Uh, but I think online screenings, you know, to reach as many people as possible would be brilliant. But yeah, as Jordan would say, you know, the Chinese Welfare Association would hopefully help us a lot with that. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, one piece I could add to that is that we hope that what uh, Selene and Jordan have done can act as a model for others because um, just over the last few weeks the African community in Belfast has got in touch with us and asked ways in which we might help and my first response was to think okay well we need to introduce them to Jordan and Selene and, and see how we can take that forward and that may be a way of measuring what impact that has already had. 
So we have a question for Louise. Um, it came in from Kate. Um, and I'm glad this question's been asked because if Louise doesn't tell the truth, I will. Um, Kate wants to know, do you have a tech background and what gave you the confidence to reach out to Future Screens and I? Um, right, uh, like, oh, right, technical, like, online and getting it no I kind of get really obsessed with knowing how stuff works and I follow a lot of people online and on YouTube and trying to figure it out and so I, I don't have I'm not qualified like I ha well actually I like I studied um I studied programming and things in school completely away from um from crafters but uh I was always really um, interested in learning how other people do things online. So it's just me researching it in my own personal, my, my own personal time. And then um, I, I work on a heritage lottery project too. So I can, I work within the community so I can actually see how craft benefits so many of the crafters alone. And then, when they're actually working with people. So I was connecting the dots in my head, thinking, my goodness, this is actually working. And then once um, once it actually came to my time to discover that how interested I was to craft, it was like somebody switched on a light. And then now I'm still trying my best to get online, learn about how to show people, because this is a new world that we're living in. I'm trying to teach people to a screen, not in person. So I'm still learning every day. And um, and then I I knew that I knew of Nula Toman um, and I was picking her brain too. And I think a lot of it is building your confidence and speaking to people that are going to help you. And she was able to tell me how what future screens was wanted and then with my experience working within community development I could see how they were trying to bridge bridge the gap and use the people that are connected in communities so that kind of gave me the confidence too that I was I could I could see it I was piecing the puzzle together and then yeah I was I was growing it I hope that's answered your question <laughs> It has, and I'm absolutely delighted you mentioned Nula Tolman as well, who's our project manager, um, because Nula is the link. Nula is the person who does give the confidence um, to, yeah. to apply to us uh, and breaks down that kind of barrier between the technology and what is going on. And, and I should also say that Nula has been vital in her understanding of policy making um, and who, how we should drive the policy within the governmental space. And I need to acknowledge that publicly and thank her for that. Thank you, Louise. Um, question here for uh, Zoe. Um, and what has been the most unexpected audience responses to Big Telly's online work? Oh my goodness! I mean, I think I think the response of the audience as a collective has been mind blowing. The sense in which people are uh, liberated um, by, uh, I think it's the agency of Zoom. I think it's the fact that you can turn your camera off means that people, you know, I wouldn't like if I was in a theatre and somebody put a spotlight on me, I would immediately leave and demand my money back. Like I would not be up for that at all. But on Zoom, you can make a very clear choice. You can just turn your cameras off. And what was happening at the start of our show is where people were turning their cameras starting with the cameras off and then gradually they were putting them on and then people were competing. So there were times there was a bit in operation elsewhere where we went through border control and people brought their pets and you would see people just lining up these animals from all over the house. You could just almost see people running out into their gardens and coming back with guinea pigs and we had snakes and we had, so there was a real sense that the audience wanted to share and sometimes wanted to compete. And, and I think that's because we were asking people People to do very kind of gentle joyful uh, uh things so yeah I, I guess the animals and the snakes and the lizard and the uh, guinea pigs from the bottom of the garden are probably the most extraordinary response but generally the way people you know the people that came back the family that covered themselves in mustard you know they'll go down in history for me and also we joke about like at the end of our shows you know people would look around their living rooms and go what on earth happened here but the point was something did happen here. Something didn't just happen on a screen. Something happened in your world too. And I think that's what's important to us about it. It's the carnivalesque, isn't it? It's, it's allowing people 
the freedom to do things which they normally wouldn't do in their everyday lived experience. Yeah, and I think something we, you know, we're really clear about in our theatre work and, you know, in our real world theatre work and, you know, in the digital is it's an invitation to play, but there's a spectrum. You know, if your playfulness is, is keeping your coat on, standing in the corner and kind of tapping your feet, that's just as valuable and as valid and as relevant as the person who wants to perch on the black back of their sofas and take all the, the inside of their cushions out <laughs> and create a, a, you know, snowstorm of feathers. You know, it's an invitation um, and and everybody is welcome to the party, whatever is their way of enjoying it. Thank you. A question from Agnieszka uh, to Jordan and Solène. Um, what has the response of the Chinese community been to the animation, Jordan? Yeah, well, we've had some amazing feedback. Like you were saying, Paul, when we uh, premiered it on Future Tuesdays, um, gosh, it feels like a lifetime ago now, maybe a couple of months ago, um, the feedback was so lovely and heartwarming, um, especially from, as you said, more senior members of the Chinese community that attended that event. Um, I think when you uh, create something like an animation, um, you kind of go into a very single-minded bubble um, with the people that are creating it with you and you know you're probably your worst critic as well you're thinking oh is it right or you know could we have done this differently and um, you know you kind of doubt yourself and just getting that validation I think from the people that we made it for was really really special for us um, and we continue to get um, really lovely feedback from people that feel like they've been represented that we did it we did them justice which was something we really felt um, was really important and you know the fact that we are thinking about further research as well because we know that there's there's more to it than the three minute animation there's more themes that emerged that we weren't able to focus on um, in three minutes um, so hopefully you know watch this space there might be a wee series coming up excellent yes I mean I do know from that future Tuesday um, just the impact it had on, on, on the Chinese community and that was very clear um, there's a question here from um, uh, about future screens, which I want to deal with as well. And it's asking what we have learned from expanding the reach of funding into the craft centre. And will this be something that we continue to do in the future? I think we've learned a number of things. First of all, that we, we learned that there were um, projects out there which we should have known about and we didn't. Um, and, and we feel kind of almost shameful about that. I know that we can't do everything. And I know that craft wasn't part of our brief. But actually, within the screen industry's craft is crucial. Um, and, and craft skills in the productions of costumes and sets and so on are absolutely crucial. And so that's encouraged us to look out there and see where that was. I think the second thing we've learned is that um, there is a way that we can bring some of the technologies which we're working with on a daily basis into that environment, which will enhance that environment and which will take it forward. And I think the third thing is that um, the impact that making something visible can have. Um, Louise has been very modest about the impact that she has had um, for the craft industry in the space. But even just last week, um, the, the Education Authority got in touch with her to say that they were absolutely blown away by our work and that they want to go into a form of partnership with her. Um, and that's the Education Authority for Northern Ireland. And so that work is now going to be going out to literally hundreds of thousands to young people and the impact that that will have on the craft industry is huge um, and so Louise needs to take credit for that the only credit we can take is that we got our act together and went into that space and saw that this was something that we ought to be supporting in some way. I, I want to just come back very quickly um, and, and ask um, Zoe in terms of uh, a sort of hint she was making because we haven't much time left now but Zoe and I'm asking in a way to speak for everybody. These processes that you started during this period, will they stop when the pandemic stop? Or have you learned enough that this needs to be continued? No, I mean, I think it's utterly transformed um, the company, you know, and, and the work. And I, I hope the sector, you know, I think it's, and I think it's been really clear that it's not a threat. You know, I hear a lot within the art sector about the digital being a threat and it absolutely isn't. 
it's a different way in um, and I feel that's a really important thing and I think what you've done through this program is shine a light on, on good work and get that good work to more people and in a different way and I think you know we will never go back I think I mean we will always make life theatre and we'll always value that but we will also always look for another way into that for for other connections and all of the work we're doing in communities and within the high street task force and all of that will now be enhanced and informed and better because of of what we've learned during this time very quick one for you Louise because uh, as I say we're coming up to the end of the session um, the question is that you know you, you've you've created this reach for yourself online and your experience kind of peaking the demand. Do do you see yourself upscaling your business as you go on? Yes, I actually have um, recently last month uh, employed one person. So for me, that is. I, I told everybody. <laughs> I was telling the post office woman that I was sending my boxes in she's telling me every day saying oh you're growing you're growing and like I've got all these three cheerleaders in my community and it's so it's so nice now I've got the post office lady she's crafting you know it's it's just like a knock-on effect it's like I know I'm using the word contagious very lightly because in mm -hmm. today's world but creativity is contagious and you have to see the true benefits of it. Like you have to feel that you have to feel the the true loss of something. Or if you're you're if you hit rock bottom, and you see the light and you have hope, it just gets everything going. So it it, it can you. only grow. I'm gonna cut across you. I'm sorry because I you're just you're to leave you saying that the creativity is contagious. I want to thank everybody who's been involved in the session. I want to thank our partners all of them, all 32, who are represented by these three. And I think what we have shown is that with a very small injection of funding, that we can actually turn what you might call community volunteerism into community economy. And that's really important. I want to thank Louise for giving us one extra job to put into our statistics for future Screen 10 I. And I want to leave you with a quote from Albert Camus, if I may. The true generosity to the future lies in giving your all to the present. And everybody you've seen today, is giving their all to the present. Thank you for being with us and thanks again for the opportunity.